Professional cycling seems like a very simple sport, doesn't it? Everybody starts together, and the first to cross the finish line is the winner. You might think that sounds simple on paper, but I can assure you it's actually much, much more complex than that. What's this guy doing? And why is this person measuring a bike? And why are their socks so long? Like any sport, there are a whole host of rules that riders have to follow to ensure fair play and safety. You're not allowed to intentionally crash another rider, nor are you allowed a motor in your bike. Both of those things are obviously unfair and are therefore banned by the UCI, cycling governing body. Some rules are pretty obvious, but there are also some which, to put it politely, are just plain stupid. With this in mind, I'm going to take you through some of the weirdest rules in professional cycling. I'm going to start with the rule that everyone loves to hate, sock length. Think back to those heady days of 2019. Everyone is happy, professional cycling is running perfectly, and every issue in the sport has been solved. Oh wait, that didn't happen. The rule dictating the maximum sock height was first introduced at a time when there were many, many other important issues they could focus on. But it's the rule that epitomizes how seriously the UCI takes micromanagement. The official rule states that socks and overshoes used in competition may not rise above the height defined by half the distance between the middle of the lateral malleolus and the middle of the fibular head. In other words, your socks can't come higher than halfway up your calves. And to drive the point home, the UCI even have a special tool to mark that exact point on the rider's legs. I know, it seems pointless, but the thinking behind this rule does actually hold some weight. Aerodynamically designed socks have become all the rage in the pro peloton over recent years, and data has proven that they genuinely do give a benefit, you know, in one case up to a 6% power saving over normal socks or a bare leg. Within reason, the higher that the socks are, the more of an aerodynamic benefit the rider will receive. Side note, I think it looks stupid, okay? I was always more of a 5-7 to seven inches kind of guy. <laughs> The comical thing is that although I could technically decide the outcome of a race, riders break the rule all the time, and they aren't really punished either. The Danish track team used kinesio tape on their shins to get around the rule, and Annemiek van Vluten was fined 200 Swiss francs after being caught breaking the rule on the way to winning the 2022 World Road Championships. Did you just say 200 Swiss francs for a World Championship title? Because that sounds like a good trade to me. So you've got your new socks on, and you've made sure that they're the regulation height, your pro career is good to go, right? Wrong. <laughs> are you sitting comfortably? No, seriously, are you sitting comfortably? Because there's a rule for that. When sitting on the bike, riders need to maintain a position that has three points of contact. The feet on the pedals, the hands on the handlebars, and the seat on the saddle. Let's get one thing straight. Professional cyclists are the best in the world at what they do. Things that might be dangerous for you and I are just par for the course for Peter Sagan or Mark Cavendish. So when the UCI made an argument for banning puppy paws, you know that aerodynamic position where riders drape their forearms over the handlebars, they claimed there would be less crashes. But puppy paws caused very little, if any, crashes in the first place. So that's a load of rubbish. And we made a whole video on the super tuck, but in essence, that's where a rider sits on the top tube of their bike and going downhill, again to aid aerodynamics and go that little bit faster. But yet again, there have been hardly any examples of crashes caused by this position. So another argument the UCI had was that banning it would discourage amateurs from adopting a potentially dangerous position on the road. But like, isn't that the equivalent of limiting Formula One drivers to 70 miles per hour? If we're being honest, this rule, the wording, and the whole reason behind it is ridiculous, which is why it's probably a good reason the UCI didn't introduce any other weird rules. Or did they? <laughs> the next rule makes sense in the context of the time, but it's odd that it hasn't really been updated since then. In the year 2000, when bike brands were getting a little bit creative with frame designs and using slightly questionable manufacturing processes, the UCI introduced a minimum bike weight of 6.8 kilograms, which has stuck around ever since. It was originally brought in to protect riders, and I'm not doubting that's a good thing. But in this day and age, where technology has progressed and brands are having to purposefully add weight in order to meet the limit, it's probably time it should be scrapped. I mean, here's Balco Molima adding weight to his bike way back in 2016 to get it over the limit. However, the focus on aerodynamics and the introduction of disc brakes does mean that manufacturers aren't focusing on weight as much as they used to. But there's still no need for there to be a minimum weight 
this high. For example, the Canyon Ultimate CFR Aero and the Specialized Ethos both come significantly below the weight limit. And every year we get rumors of a change in the rules, but it never materializes. Instead, we're stuck with a rule from the turn of the millennium that just hasn't kept up with the change in technology. I think reducing the weight limit would bring a sort of jeopardy to bike choice on those epic mountain stages too. Would you rather have a super light, less aerodynamic frame with rim brakes or a slightly heavier frame set with all that aero and disc brake advantage? Finally, I want you to picture the scene. You're in the critical moment of a race. The bunch is flying along when suddenly you hear a noise. Oh dear, what's that? It's a puncture. Your team car is nowhere to be found, but don't worry, a rider on another team, who you're friends with and has no chance of winning, helps you out with their own wheel. If a rival team wants to help you out, then why should it be discouraged? Acts of sportsmanship are what fans love to see and they bring a human element to the sport. It's not unusual to see teams help riders out with bottles, but mechanical sport can technically be punished, as Richie Port found out in 2015 Giro d'Italia. While fighting for the general classification, the Australian rider suffered a puncture at a vital moment. Enter scene, fellow countryman but rival team member, Simon Clark, who gave Richie Port a spare wheel so he could continue in the race. This incredible act was applauded by fans, by riders, commentators, and even the race's own social media profile. But don't you worry, a quick check of UCI rule 12.1040 and you can see that non-regulation assistance to a rider from another team is prohibited. Whoopow! The UCI commissaires didn't like that at all, so they come along and slap a two-minute penalty on port and an insult to injury with a fine of 200 Swiss francs. What I want to know is this. Why is waiting for a stricken rival any different? The moment that Jonas Vingegaard waited for Tadej Pogacar after his crash on stage 18 of the Tour de France was incredible. Conversely, in one-day races, the riders don't generally wait, and there's no expectation of chivalry. Sure, this doesn't happen very often, but why should helping out another rider from another team be against the rules? You know, I, I get that there are questions around betting, but I'd rather we just let riders decide on the road, and then we can have our heroes and our villains. There are so many rules in modern cycling that it's hard to cover all the craziest ones in this video. So are there any weird rules that we missed? Let me know in the comments and I'll see if we can do a video on them in the future. Finally, if you want to understand why pro cycling banned its fastest position, click on this video right here to find out. Once again, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.